Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and we're going to go back and play an old episode focused on the Shawnee Chief, Tecumseh. Now, this is an old episode with me and Mr. Pope. We take a look at Tecumseh and his life. Some of the content we talk about is from Alan Eckert's novels, which are considered historical fiction. If you're interested in learning more about Tecumseh, you can also read A Sorrow in Your Heart by Alan Eckert, which takes, a, which takes more of a focus on Tecumseh's life. However, if you want a more historical-based book, check out Tecumseh and the Prophet, The Heroic Struggles for America's Heartland by Peter Cousins. And you know, the interesting thing, Jameson, is about that history is connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things you learn is that everything is connected to everything else. Yeah. Just like in nature and the universe. Yeah. You know? well, and so if you're in Montana, somehow Kentucky history relates, know, to, you. relates to you. Yeah. And, and when you think of two, if you want to get... Uh, very technical, uh, technical That's what we're here. supposed to do. Here. <laughs> um, the Native Americans that were in Kentucky, you know, we, we can get we'll get into that eventually, where they were forced to move west, right. and, and a lot of these, a lot of the Native Americans were, um, they were ended up in the west, you know, originated in this the is, east in the Kentucky. This this podcast is actually about that. And it's it the takes, roots of that. It, it, it's it, about moving the Shawnee Indians out of their yeah, territory perfect. and there the man go. who stood in the way to resist it. All right, all right. So we've been talking about Daniel Boone. We've talked about Simon Kenton, and we've talked a little bit about Simon Gertie as well. But now, as we mentioned in the last podcast, history is all about perspective. That's right. So what perspective do we have today? We have the perspective of a Native American chief, one of the most interesting ones in American history, by the name of Tecumseh. And that, that's really exciting. He, he is one of my favorite characters of American history. Uh, or of all history, period, anywhere. Mm -hmm. He was a man that superseded everyone else. He was an incredible person. And, you know, there's so many ways. We have just such a short amount of time to talk about him. And what angle do we want? We talk mm -hmm. about his bravery or his mm -hmm. fighting or his intelligence and all that. He had something that practically no other human being had or has had. He was clairvoyant. Oh, wow. He knew what was going to happen uh -huh. before it happened. Yeah. And that is something very rare. When I think of people in history, mm -hmm. I know people that have visions yeah. and who can think about, you know, their ideas for the future and mm -hmm. project those. You know, I can't hardly think of anyone throughout all of history, unless, you know, maybe you include Jesus Christ, that actually knew, you know, the yeah. destiny of what things were going to gonna be yeah. Yeah. Uh, for certain and could mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. A visionary who could see it. So you've got this Shawnee who grows up and becomes a chief, and he, he, can, he knows what's going to happen almost yeah. all the time, yeah. and he predicts it, mm -hmm. and he uses that tool to unite the Indians. Yeah. Now, if you just look at, at, at Tecumseh as an Indian chief, major chief of the Shawnee, you know, you say, you know, you read the history books, and they'll, they'll define him as the leader who had this vision to unite all the Indians, you know, uh, west of the Allegheny Mountains. Mm-hmm. To unite against a common enemy, mm -hmm. which were the Americans. Yeah. And he, in doing so, in order to provide him with weapons and forces and so forth, he sided with the British. Uh -huh. You know. And we've already said in Kentucky history that Kentuckians and their forts were fighting the British, both in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. That's what it looked like. Yeah. And Tecumseh becomes a spearhead. And he tries to get all these tribes who have for thousands and thousands of years, just fought amongst themselves mm -hmm. over land and territory. Yeah. And he sees this huge invasion of Europeans mm -hmm. moving into his sacred land and grounds. And, and he sees them making treaties and then violating the treaties and making another treaty and just gradually taking his land. Yeah. And he just goes bananas. Mm -hmm. He just can't handle it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's how he comes to be. I want to, Start. I'm going to read several passages once again from the Frontiersman by Alan W. Eckert, and I want to just start with his birth. Sounds uh, good. And you know, from the very beginning, there were like mystical things happening, <laughs> and that's what makes it so cool. Like when he's born in Chillicothe, Ohio, March the ninth, seventeen sixty-eight. You know, he, you know, he born under the sign of shooting stars, just explode in the sky at the moment of his birth, wow. and all the Indians witness it and record mm -hmm. it in history. And this is Alan W. Eckert's take on it. His, his father is praying, um, you know, outside the probably longhouse 
uh, hut where his wife is getting ready to deliver a baby and there's women sitting around the fire. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, he's wanting to find the right words to Manito, which is their God. He raised his eyes skyward, but the prayer died a morning as a huge meteor suddenly plunged into the atmosphere and burst into brilliant greenish white flame. It streaked across the heavens from the north in an awe-inspiring spectacle, which lasted fully 20 seconds. Punkinswa had heard of such occurrences, but not before he had he ever seen anything so breathtaking as this, and the tales of the old people came back to him now. So it goes on, it says, From within the temporary shelter came the sharp wail of a baby. And so it goes on, uh, and he says, A Shawnee custom declares... So his baby boy is born, and he says, A Shawnee custom declares that a, a boy baby is not named for 10 days after his birth, nor a girl for 12, during which time an unsuma, a notable event, would occur which should indicate what Manito wished the child to be called. But this time the sign had been given at the very moment of birth, and this was of great importance. Both Pugnanswa and Methatasa knew there could be no other name for this boy than the panther passing across. Thus was born and named the Shawnee Indian known as Tecumseh. Wow. So the tradition was for them to wait 10 days before That's they That's right. Name, for a but, boy, 12 days for a girl. But for this, in this scenario, they named him instantly. From, mm-hmm. from, just from the signs. That's right. That's uh, It just so, blew so, him away. Yeah. And the stars just exploded in the sky. <laughs> You know, it's like the, the, the star was like a panther that races across the star every mm-hmm. night, the sky, and finds a place to sleep. So Tecumseh grows up, and there was an event that happened that there was a treaty signed, and they're living near Chillicothe, Ohio, somewhere in that region. That's where the major principal Shawnee village is. And there were some whites that crossed the Ohio River into what is now Ohio, into this area. And Tecumseh's father and a few braves went to confront them, saying, you know, this is our land, mm-hmm. and they killed his father. Oh, okay. So this kind of formed a little bit mm-hmm. of an impression on his yes. life, and he loved his father. So as custom uh, in a tribal community, he's raised by his uncle. And his uncle and everybody sees that this boy is special from day one. Yeah. Okay? And so he teaches him everything he possibly can. Yes. You know, to be as great as he can. So when Tecumseh's eight years old, here's another just a physical description of him. It said, For an eight-year-old, Tecumseh was unusually tall. He stood very erect and was a remarkably intelligent and good-looking youngster. His abilities were apparent in whatever he found it important to excel. He, re- he reveled in the games and, sp- and sports engaged in and hit with his many companions at Chillicothe and listened carefully to the lessons received from his brother, Chikaska, and others who taught him. More than a few times, Chief Blackfish had eyed him approvingly and thought how proud of his son Punkinsaw would have been. And it goes on and talks about his life. And one thing about Tecumseh that was different than the other Indians, there were many things, Mm -hmm. is that he was very morally correct. Uh You know, as a 12-year-old, he went into Blackfish Lodge with the elders where they had burned a white man at the stake. Mm -hmm. He goes, this isn't what Shawnee people do that are great warriors. You don't tie a person to a stake and murder them. Uh You know, and he said, shame on you. He he shamed his elders at 12 years old. And he just said, you know, if I'm ever chief, this is never going to happen again under my watch. Wow. And that, I mean, he just did things like that. He was very ethical. Uh If he played sports, you know, it wasn't like, well, I'm going to win at any cost. You know, he was like caring for other people, yeah. caring for nature. You know, he felt mm-hmm. it was his God. I mean, he was just a super human being. Tecumseh goes ahead and, you know, he, he lives his life and, you know, he does a lot of things and he ties in with the British and he tries to get other tribes to uh, denounce these treaties that, you know, there, there would be one tribe that would make a treaty and give up land that belonged <laughs> to another tribe you know, just to get their favor, to yeah. get them off their back. and. Tecumseh was saying this was all wrong, mm-hmm. and, and this land that his his ancestors were buried in, the burial grounds, some of the chiefs had ceded that land to the white people where mm-hmm. they could hunt, in land that his father had died for, trying yeah. to protect, you know, you know, legally, mm-hmm. according to the white man's law. So he was really upset about it. And he began to see things like, you know, we're all brothers, we're all Native Americans, and why can't all these tribes unite against a common foe yeah. instead of dividing up and fighting mm-hmm. amongst themselves? Mm-hmm. 
So this was his thought. You know, you'd yeah. think this would be a thought they would have, but we look at like, well, they're Indians. Uh -huh. You know, we glump them all the same, but they're as different as French are from German or uh -huh. English are from Spanish. You know, they, I mean, they're just totally different. They look different. They're physically different. They have, you know, similarities, but they also have things that aren't mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. And they control certain areas of land. Yeah. And they've been fighting for land and resources. For hundreds of years. And this is the same thing that's going on from Europe. We've said it before, you know, but it's good to get the big perspective when you look at history. What are these white people doing in North America? Yeah. Europe had totally exhausted their resources. There was mm -hmm. no more wild game. There were no more trees. Mm -hmm. They had just raped the land and huge populations of people starving, mm -hmm. disease, plague. And yeah. so they come to North America. Yeah. And here is just like in the whole world, this is like, you know, Irvana. You know, yeah. it's like great forest, A animals, utopia. fish, utopia. And so what do they do? They come and they rape it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's basically what they do. Mm -hmm. They set up colonies. And the definition of a colony is you take the resources of your area and you send it back to your mother country. Yeah. Whether it's English colonies, Spanish, Spanish. colonies, yes. French colonies, they're all here for the resources. Mm -hmm. And so here are these Indians, the natives that are living here. You know, we're talking about perspective now. Yeah. You know, and they're just trying to, to guard what's theirs and yeah. protect it. Or they'll die and starve. Yeah. And they depend on it for yeah. their food source. So here we go. So Tecumseh, this clairvoyant person, I mean, when he's in battle, like when he's like 14 years old or 13 years old, he goes into his first battle and he kills like eight people. And his favorite weapon is a war club mm -hmm. against people with long rifles. Yeah. So you can just imagine how, you know, he just runs and, you know, right into the face of fire and, you know, no fear at all yeah. and just bashes people. And like there were times when he was in battle and he there would be a man hiding behind a tree. Mm -hmm a big tree, let's say, yeah. and he would know the moment that man would step out behind the tree and he would aim his gun to that spot and the man would step right into it and he'd shoot him. Wow. Because he knew what the man was going to mm -hmm. do. I mean, that he, you know, it wasn't like every once in a while he has this vision. Oh, yeah. I can go on and on about Tecumseh, but, you know, it's like he has this brother that's named the prophet and he's, yeah. he's jealous of Tecumseh oh. and he wants his power and yeah. Tecumseh loves his brother so he tells him some things that's going to happen and this guy becomes known as the prophet he's mm -hmm. a medicine man mm -hmm. but he's an alcoholic uh. and it's not good and he's really just a, a waste and he just you know he wants power yeah you know, he just stars for power mm -hmm. so he gets his brother to kind of help him to say certain things are going to happen so they believe it's him so anyway I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but while Tecumseh's away, the prophet says that he's got this vision that if they all attack right now, that they'll be victorious. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're not. He doesn't have that vision. He yeah, lied, he... and they, the Indians get slaughtered. But anyway, Tecumseh, and this is this to me is the most interesting thing about Tecumseh's life that I'm getting ready to tell you about. And this is incredible. So he goes into the south, and he visits it's all these tribes. I mean, I think it takes him years. Mm -hmm. and, and he meets with them unafraid and says, listen, you're my brother. We need to work together. Da, da, mm -hmm. da, da, da. He said, the great spirit is with me. And he says, I'm going to give you a bundle of sticks. Yeah. Okay. And he gives him a bundle of these twigs. Mm -hmm. And he says, like every moon or something, I want you to take one stick from this pile. Mm -hmm. And when you're out of sticks, something great is going to happen. And this is what he says, uh, as the great sign is going to happen. Yeah. He tells them. And this is from uh, the frontiersman again. This great sign that Tecumseh spoke of, or wherever he went, always remained the same, and his telling of it never failed to awe his audience. When the period of waiting was over, he told them when tribal unification had been completed, when all was in readiness, then would this sign be given. In the midst of night, the earth beneath would tremble and roar for a long period. Jugs would break, though there would be no one near to touch them. Great trees would fall, Though the air, uh, though the air be windless, streams would change their course to run backwards, and lakes would be swallowed up into the earth, and other lakes suddenly appear. The bones of every man would tremble, and with the trembling of the ground, and they would not mistake it. No, there was not anything to compare with it in their lives, nor in the lives of their fathers or their fathers before them since time began. When this sign came. They were to drop their mattocks and flesh scrapers, leave their fields and their hunting camps and their villages, and join together and move to assembled areas the Lake River from the fort of Detroit. And on that day, they would no longer be Mohawks or Senecas, Oneidas or Ogandagas or any other tribe. They would be Indians. 
one people united forever, where the good of one would henceforth become the good of all. So it would be. Wow. That's what he told them. Now, that's pretty heavy. That he is. also told them that day would become night and night would become day at uh-huh. the same time. <laughs> he said the day would be dark yeah. like night. And we're going to find out what happens okay. in just a minute. <laughs> Hang on to your bootstraps, man. Uh, what, what it was, he predicted the great earthquake uh-huh. of 1811 that okay. formed Real Foot Lake and so forth. Yeah. And uh, the rivers did run backwards, and all these things actually happened just like he said it was going to happen. Okay, well, that was my question was, yes. did it happen? It happened. <laughs> it happened just to the detail that he said. You know, uh, frontier cabins in Kentucky, their chimneys mm-hmm. broke apart and fell. Mm-hmm. So if you look at a house that was maybe built in the 1790s or early 1800s before mm-hmm. 1811, yeah. you look at the chimney and it's probably been rebuilt yeah. because of Tecumseh's prophecy. Wow. And the great uh, St. Andrew's Fault, yeah. that lies along the Mississippi River. Uh-huh. That's what this was. And, uh-huh. and they're predicting we're going to get one again. Oh, wow. And the geologists oh. say it's going to all happen again, that that was a St. Andrew's Fault is huge, uh-huh. and it's just ready to happen. Geologists say any time okay. we can uh-huh. experience it. So Good thing I got an earthquake insurance. Yeah, get your earthquake <laughs> Yeah, sign up. Go to State Farm, and they will sell you some uh, happen. So we jump a little further ahead, and... On December the 16th, 1811, it was a Monday, at 2.30 in the morning, the earth began to shake, according to Alan W. Ecker. In the south of Canada, in the villages of the Iroquois, Ottawa, Chippewa, and Huron, it came as a deep, terrifying rumble. Creek banks caved in, and huge trees toppled in a continuous crash of snapping branches. In all the Great Lakes, but especially Lake Michigan and Lake Erie, the waters danced and the great waves broke erratically on the shores, though there was no wind. In the western plains, there was a fierce grinding sound and a shuddering, which jarred the bones and set teeth on edge. Earthen vessels split apart and great herds of bison staggered to their feet and stampeded in abject panic. To the south and west, tremendous boulders broke loose on hills and cut swaths through the trees and brush to the bottoms. Rapidly rushing streams stopped and eddied, and some of them abruptly went dry, and the fish that had lived in them flopped away their lives on the muddy or rocky beds. To the south, whole forests fell in incredible tangles. New streams sprang up where the none had been before. In the upper upper creek village of Tukatachi, Every dwelling shuddered and shook and then collapsed upon itself and its inhabitants. To the south and east, palm trees lashed about like whips and lakes emptied of their waters, while ponds appeared in huge declivities which suddenly dented the surface of the earth. All over the land, birds were roused from their roosting places with screams of fright and flapping wings. Cattle bellowed and kicked lost their footing, and were thrown to the ground where they rolled about, unable to regain their balance. In Kentucky and Tennessee and the Indian Territory, settlers were thrown from their beds and heard the timbers of their cabins wrench apart and watched the bricks crumble into heaps of debris, masked in choking clouds of dust. Bridges snapped and timbered into rivers and creeks. Glass shuddered, fences and barns collapsed, and fires broke out. Along steep ravines, the cliffside slipped and filled with their chasms, and the country was blanketed with a deafening roar. And it goes on, it says, In the center of all this, the Ohio River meets the Mississippi, where Tennessee and Kentucky, Arkansas and Missouri and Illinois come together. Fantastic splits appeared in the ground, and huge tracts of land were swallowed up. A few miles from the Mississippi near the Kentucky-Tennessee border, a monstrous section of ground sank as if some gigantic foot had stepped on the soft earth and mashed it down. Water gushed forth in fantastic volume, and the depression became filled and turned into a large lake to be known as Real Foot Lake today. The whole midsection of the Mississippi wreathed and heaved, and tremendous bluffs toppled into the muddy waters. Such was the great sign of Tecumseh. Pretty, ma- pre- pretty amazing. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And that's, yeah. you know, you think this is fiction. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. It's not. It's yeah. not. This happens. This is recorded geologically that these things happen. Yeah. And Tecumseh talked about it a year before it happened wow. and even knew the moment that it was going to yeah. happen. And, and and with no, I mean, just intuition, I guess, or just, just that clairvoyancy, as you said, is, yeah. is, would be the only would be the only thing we could, or you could 
account it to. Yeah. So, you know, Tecumseh's Federation, you know, fought the United States during what they call the Tecumseh War. Mm -hmm. But he was unsuccessful in getting the U.S. government to rescind the Treaty of Fort Wayne, which gave a lot of land, uh, you know, session treaties. You know, and he, in 1811, he traveled south to the Cherokees and tried to, you know, get more and more. Uh, he, he defended Prophetstown against William Henry Harrison's army in the Battle of Tippecanoe. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you know the, the Native Americans retreated from the field and European Americans, you know, unearthed graves and burned Prophetstown. Uh, he was the leader of this group. Uh, they continued to fight the United States after forming an alliance. Remember, the United States had been formed. This was after mm -hmm. the Revolutionary War and with Great Britain in the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. That's the one, you know, that started and that, you know, oh, say can you see so these <laughs> and all that. And, you know, they burned Washington and all yeah. that stuff. But again, they were the, the British were using the Indian allies and the Indians mm -hmm. hoped that the British would remember that. They took Fort Detroit and they say Tecumseh was, uh, you know, famous for that. You know, another thing, he was made the general. He was the only chief that was made general of British Army. Oh, they, wow. They gave him the rank of general uh, yeah. and the British Army. And I think at some point he gave it back to him, and he said it didn't mean anything to him. He was an Indian, and he didn't like being a general, you know, of their yeah. army. He wasn't British, uh, anyway. The thing that's also really interesting that goes along with this theme we're talking about today is when he died at the Battle of Thames on October the 5th, 1813. Um, his, his death and the end of the war, you know, broke up the alliance. But in the battle, they had fought one day, I think, and, and he told, he gathered, that night he gathered all of his tribe around, and he said, tomorrow I'm going to die. Oh, wow. And he said that if you'll take the ramrod of my gun, and he said, they're going to shoot me right at the beginning of the battle. It's going to shoot me like right in the head, Yeah. and I'm going to die. And wow. he said, but if you will take the ramrod out of my gun and tap me three times with it, and don't be afraid and continue to uh, attack, yeah. you will be victorious and win the battle. He wow. said, if you try to worry about me and take me back, you'll, you'll, you'll all be defeated. And when he did just as he said, he, he walked right out, led the, the tribe against the attack, and the, practically the first shot killed him. him. And they panicked. Uh -huh. They panicked because they just couldn't believe it. Yeah. He gave away all of his worldly things that night, like had earrings and he uh -huh. gave away and bracelets. He kept, only he kept was his famous war club, gave his rifle away, uh -huh. everything material in the world. He gave it to his friends the night before. Wow. He only had his war club and yeah. his naked body. When he went into battle, and uh, they uh, tapped him with the rod uh, three times. I don't know if it was a rod of his gun or somebody else's, but um, and but they didn't do that. They grabbed his body up, and and they were all defeated. They mm -hmm. gave him such grief and so forth that, but uh, they tried to get his body. But mm -hmm. They all just ran in panic, and that was when dovetailing with Simon Kenton, mm -hmm. he saw Tecumseh's yeah. body and respected it, and told him it was another chief because. Yeah. Tecumseh looked so plain and wasn't dressed like a chief too uh -huh, there because we go. he'd given everything away. Uh -huh. and, but Simon Kenton recognized him and they allowed them to come back and get their body and they mutilated the body of another chief mm -hmm. yeah. you know, who was dressed like a chief. Yeah. But Tecumseh saw that. I mean, Simon Kenton saw that. Well, so. that, well that's, that's, that's a very good way for those two yeah. stories to connect because that mm -hmm. would make more sense that he'd already given all this stuff away so he mm -hmm. didn't look as if he that's was right. a chief. He's just, you know, just pure, interesting character, you know, and it's just hard for me to fathom. This sounds like mm -hmm. a fairy tale, but it's really backed up by it a does. lot of historical legend and study and, you know, you know, even the prophecy of the earthquake and so forth that took place. And it was an eclipse of the sun and the moon that also happened. Happened when, you know, oh, okay. That, and that's what led night into day and, mm -hmm. you know, and everyone felt it and everyone knew it. And he predicted the exact moment that yeah. it would happen, which was just unbelievable. You know, the battle of, uh, that he died in was actually in Canada across the lakes from the Great Lakes, and that's where he was killed. Mm -hmm. You know, as we've seen a, kind of a lot of the Native Americans, we saw Simon Gurdy retreat to Canada, yeah. you know, after the War of 1812, but, but uh, Tecumseh was killed in it. Well, so. and, and just to add to our, so far, our discussion of, mm -hmm. I don't want to say characters, but historical people, you know, we talked about Boone. And the Siege of Boonesboro. Mm -hmm. Talked about Simon Kenton and him running the gauntlet, and Simon Gurdy come in to you know mm -hmm. uh, so, rescue yeah. him in a way. Mm -hmm. And now we have Tecumseh, who was able to predict all these things that happened. And as you were saying, and they all sound so much like fairy tales and these you know wild fantasy stories. 
but yet those things do happen and that's kind of maybe that's probably where people get these stories from mm-hmm. you know you look at the fantasy stories you may see today or in the past you know these things that have happened are what's forming people's mm-hmm. not to say imagination but their their stories yeah and which history you know as in time goes mm-hmm. becomes stories and legend and myths and so forth that's right I hope that I see it as I talk about it, and I think you do too, and I hope our listeners do see how all these are related. You know, the lives are just kind of intertwined. You know, Boone, Kenton, Tecumseh, uh, Gertie, you know, uh, Fort Herod, uh, James Herod, um, you know, all these, you know, Logan Fort here in Stanford. You know, all of them are just kind of inter, you know, all these people are. You know, affecting each other's lives, and they, they're, they're all kind of dovetailed together. Mm-hmm. You know, both Boone and Kenton mm-hmm. uh, fought against Tecumseh yeah. at one time or another. And, wow. Uh, you know, they were well aware of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one thing to earn respect Kenton was to kind your... of scared to death of him. I mean, he, he fought him and almost killed him one time uh, in a surprise attack, but Tecumseh, they had Tecumseh and his men totally surrounded in southern Ohio, uh-huh. and it was like morning when they were waking up, yeah. and they were in these like little shelters. There were maybe 15 or 20 um, Indians with Tecumseh, Mm -hmm. and they just started shooting into the tents or whatever. And (laughs) and instead of everyone panicking and running, Tecumseh gathered up all his men, and they went right after the people in the ambush and killed more of them than they killed of the Indians. I mean, he was just a fierce leader. He didn't didn't run. Yeah. You know, and he probably knew that if Mm -hmm. they do that, you know, that's just what they want to do was them to panic. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He ordered his braves to just, wherever they're shooting from, just charge them, go after them, (laughs) you know, drive them out. You think of... Um, and Kenton said, you know, when, when this happened, he was saying he knew that he was up against a mighty leader and wanted to get the heck out of there because yeah. he said that he was next <laughs> in line to get his head bashed in. You know, I mean, that's the way he told about it. He yeah. said, man, we've met somebody that's not no, like yeah. any other foe we've ever met. Mm-hmm. You know, this guy is something else. Well, he, Kenton recognized that. And you think about Kenton and Tecumseh in this matter. It's one thing to earn respect among your peers, yeah. but to earn respect among... Your enemies is even even a bigger attribute. Absolutely. And Tecumseh, for sure, was one. But on the other hand, so was Kenton. Whenever he was, he did the gauntlet nine times with the Native Americans, and you know, he earned a lot of respect from them as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, again, these people, these big historical kind of figures, mm-hmm. you know, connecting yeah. in, in different in many ways. And that's what's so fun about history is mm-hmm. that you know it's like a puzzle, and when you put all the pieces together you begin to see it so clearly yeah that's when i get so excited about history is because you know just just barely my mental <laughs> facilities are pretty low faculties but uh you know when i do put things together though it's like wow yeah you know that really works i can see how that would be and then mm-hmm. if you study it so much you kind of get good at it and you understand cause and effect relationships mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know this caused this to happen and this caused that and if you do this and if you do that and you know it's kind of Kind of interesting. Yeah, and I hope too that people that are listening are appreciating more of the detail that we're getting into because mm-hmm. we've all had fifth grade history, but yet have we got to this point, to this deep of knowledge of the people intertwining, more people that maybe you didn't even realize were a piece of the puzzle. It's true. You know, It's true. Some of the quotes from Tecumseh, and these won't surprise you when you hear them, he said, uh, show respect to all people but grovel to none. Mm-hmm. A single twig breaks, but the bundle of twigs is strong. Uh-huh. You know, think about Kentucky's motto, United we stand, divided we fall. Yeah. You know, sell a country, why? Why not sell the air? Why not sell the clouds and the great sea as well as the earth? Did not the great spirit make them all for the use of his children? Mm-hmm. So he couldn't mm-hmm. understand the sale of land. He goes, yeah. why don't you sell the clouds up there, man? <laughs> you know, why don't you sell the, the trees or the air that we breathe? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, he just couldn't fathom that. Mm-hmm. He said, this is... God's, you know, territory. You can't sell God. Yeah. You know, I mean, the spirit is within all of nature. How can you sell the spirit of Mm -hmm. God? Yeah. People are crazy, man. (laughs) (laughs) That's that that one. That's very insightful. Yeah. So you know, it's it's kind of interesting. He was he's really, really something. My my most interesting. He Simon Kenton as a white man and Tecumseh the other, and it's all formatted in this book, The Frontiersman as well as a series of Gateway to Empire and mm-hmm. Wilderness Empire and so mm-hmm. forth that Eckert wrote. Pretty good stuff. So on this rainy day in Kentucky, <laughs> as I look out the windows here at uh, Crab Orchard Elementary School and the playground out back and the kids, you know, the rain's pouring down and 
winter's coming on and you know we think back on what what it was like back in the frontier mm-hmm. day when the indians mm-hmm. roamed these woods and the yeah. frontiersmen i'm sure Boone and Kenton lanes. went right through this land we're looking at out, oh, yeah. out your window here you know the the wilderness road is only mm-hmm. about 100 yards from here yep and they mm-hmm. traveled that you know ferociously you know up and down so it's really interesting it i is. love it and kentucky comes to life with its mm-hmm. history it really does. Which wherever you are listening to this, it may or may not be raining, but... <laughs> it's raining here, <laughs> by God. If I say it's raining, it's raining. Um, again, so let's... This is Kentucky. Yeah, if you, if you stick around, the weather will change. Yes, yeah. it will. Laura well, will understand ourselves by understanding history. There you go. All right, with that being said... Toodaloo. See you later. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs> I hope you enjoy one of our first episodes. In the coming weeks and months, we have some content coming out that focuses on the Native Americans in Kentucky and the roles they played. So stay tuned, and thanks again for watching.